I mentioned last week that we're going to be using as our theme for the year uh, great biblical promises. And starting today, we're going to talk for a few weeks about the Holy Spirit. We're going to take a little break in the middle and talk a little bit about, um, well, actually, we're going to, to kind of uh, take the, the last week of Christ and lead up to his, res- his death and his burial and resurrection, uh, which will take us up to Easter. Then we'll do a few more about the Spirit, and then we're going to do some things on grace and the Beatitudes. And I know you've said, well, Jim, you've preached on the Beatitudes before. Yeah, I've been here 15 and a half years. I figure that uh, it would be good to go back to the teachings of Jesus at the very beginning again. So we're going to do some of that too. So um, I hope you enjoy the, the, the different things we're going to be talking about during this year. C.S. Lewis said, you may forget that you are at every moment totally dependent on God. Isn't that the truth? We are always dependent on God. And the apostles couldn't understand why Jesus kept saying that he was going to leave them. And they were worried. They were concerned. They didn't know what in the world they were going to do if Jesus left or when he left. And he even told them, he says, the Holy Spirit cannot come unless I leave. And they knew that their life was totally enwrapped in Jesus. They knew that, you know, and maybe for the wrong reason, but they were afraid, they were concerned because their hopes relied completely on him. That's why the Holy Spirit was sent. The Holy Spirit's been an interesting topic for a long, long time. It seems like every generation we bring it all up all over again. I remember, and and this is as a, a little kid in the 60s, that it cropped up during the 60s. And, 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 and I remember my parents, I, I was never in on the conversation. I was too young, I guess. But I remember people talking. It was one of those kinds of things about, oh, they're, you know, they're, they're getting involved in the spirit and all those kind of uh, issues. And everybody was afraid that we were going to go down into the deep end. Sometimes I think that's where we need to be, is in the deep end. But it didn't help that we called him the Holy Ghost. It was kind of this mysterious specter that lurked behind the doors and would kind of jump out and scare us every once in a while. And he was spooky and not understandable. And so we did what we tend to do on controversial topics. We pendulum swing. If you've been in any of my classes, I've talked about this before, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Anytime we come up to a a subject or a topic that we struggle or don't agree on necessarily or, or it just is one of those kind of difficult topics, we do one of two things. We tend to swing clear way over on one side and say, okay, this is what it is. And then when when people get upset and all of a sudden emotions get involved, and then we swing clear back over on the other side over here. In fact, what we tend to do is to completely ignore subjects. And so we wrap it up in a neat little box and we put it over in the corner and we don't ever talk about it again. When in essence, the Holy Spirit is on every page of Scripture. It should be a vital part of our lives. He should be there at all times in our lives. We are offspring of the enlightenment and of the age of reason. And so what we think we can do is to just put everything through the scientific method and we'll all come out on the same side at the same end with the same conclusions. Not so with the Holy Spirit. Not so with the Holy Spirit. And don't misunderstand me on this. But the Holy Spirit cannot be explained. We can't understand all the ins and outs and the workings of the Holy Spirit. And by that, I mean that God's ways are different than my ways. He moves in mysterious ways. He does things differently than I do. Or he does, differently, uh, he does things differently than I would. James Dobson even wrote a book called When God Doesn't Make Sense. I highly recommend it to you. He says there are times when you come in your life where God just doesn't make sense. And so he says, I prefer to just obey rather than despair. And sometimes he just doesn't make sense. Isaiah 55 says, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways 
and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I've mentioned this before. If you don't think God's ways are different than our ways, just think about different things like Jericho. Jericho, God says, listen, here's how we're going to conquer Jericho. I would have said, let's take a, 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 one of these great teams in and we're going to do a, a, a little uh, a, a little kind of sneaky kind of raid in there. We're going to pull them out. We're going to do all kinds of things and then we'll smack them. And God says, yeah, that's a good idea, but I tell you what, let's march around once every day. So well, God, that's, that's really nice, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. He says, well, I got one better. After you've done that, seven, we're on the seventh day, we're going to march around seven times. And then you're going to blow your trumpet. All right, God, that sounds like a good plan. Well, it worked, didn't it? And we find example after example after example in Scripture where God does things completely different. And it's the same with the Holy Spirit. And that worries some people. And we become uncomfortable. And so, as I said, what we tend to do is say, because I'm uncomfortable, what we're going to do is just go and put it in a little box and put him over in the corner. And here's a problem. We have assigned the Holy Spirit as a first century phenomenon, and in most cases, a miracles only being. A gift that was given only to the first century church until we, get, we got the Bible in its complete form. And we use passages like 1 Corinthians 13, where it says, For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, the imperfect disappears. And we say, see, we got scriptures, and now we have all we need. That's not what he's talking about there. The perfection is not scripture there. We assign that, that scripture to that passage there in, in 1 Corinthians 13. So what do you do with a passage like Acts 2.38, our passage? Repent and be baptized every one of you for the remission of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, that was way before we had Scripture. Well, the only Scripture we had then was the Old Testament. So when, when they baptized the 3,000 on that day, were they standing there handing them out Bibles of the, old, the Scriptures of the Old Testament? Well, I think it means more than that. It's not only in the Word. Scripture was only in the Old Testament at the time. And this conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Jesus had told Nicodemus that he must be born again. Now, I love the book of John. I call it the AMFM book. <laughs> because, you remember, and, and AMFM is different than when we were children, when most of us were younger, because FM didn't have commercials and AM did. AM was more of a local thing. FM played more music. And it was one of those kind of things where if in most cars, my, when I was a kid growing up, we only had AM. We didn't have AM, FM. We, when we got an FM in our car, we were in high cotton. And so we have this, this AM, FM gospel. And we find it all throughout the Gospel of John. Jesus comes up to a woman who's, who's drawing water out of a well, and he says, you know what, I'm thirsty, but if you drink this water, you're going to get thirsty again, but let me give you living water. And she says, Lord, let me have this living water so I don't have to come back and bring my sheep again. And we have these kind of things all throughout Scripture where Jesus says one thing and means one thing, and everybody takes him for another thing. And so we come to this in John chapter 3 where Nicodemus comes to Jesus and he says, you know what, you've got to be born again. And Nicodemus says, well, how can a man enter his mother's womb a second time and be born again? AMFM. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth. Now listen to this. I think this is key. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. No one means no one. You cannot enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of water and the Spirit. Francis Chan calls the Holy Spirit the forgotten God. If we're going to be a church that impacts our community, and perhaps even the world, we must be Spirit-filled and Spirit-led 
We can be surprised by the Spirit's movements and accomplishments through us, but totally awed by the power of God. God must get all the glory, and when we begin to rely on ourselves, the power, our lights, will go out dimly. It is only through the power of God will we be able to make a difference, and it's only through His Spirit being in each one of us. Well, how do I know if we have the Spirit? How do I know if the Southwest Church has the Spirit of God? Turn to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. Paul's getting done talking to the Galatians here as he ends this epistle to them. And he says, so I say, live by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the sinful nature. For the sinful nature desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the sinful nature. So obviously what happens, if we are only thinking in terms of, of physical, material, only in terms of ourselves, then we are not being led by the spirit. If we think in terms of what God can do and how he's going to do it, we may not even know how, we may not even assign a way to know that, he, that we know how, but only that he is leading us, then we will be spirit-led. He says they're in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. But if you're led by the Spirit, well, this is what he says here, you're not under law. Then he, he goes on, he describes the acts of a sinful nature. So are we... A church that has these characteristics. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. And, and by the way, growing up and the like just took in everything else I didn't like. <laughs> Did you ever notice that? Yeah. All the preachers said, that, that means anything else, you know. And the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. All right, we read in John that says, unless you're born of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And here he says, if you have the works of the flesh of the sinful nature, guess what? You can't enter the kingdom of God. Now, we sit here and we say, oh, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, debauchery. Oh, we, we haven't debauched in a long time. <laughs> Idolatry, witchcraft. Oh, we don't have witchcraft here. Read the ones in, be in between. Dissensions, factions, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, factions, Envy. Those are the ones that, that kind of get me a little bit worried sometimes. I've been in churches that have those kind of things. We need to watch for those kind of things. And when that happens, we can say, we're not being led by the Spirit. But then he goes on and says this. And, and I don't know about you, but, but the feeling that I get as I read this I, I don't know if you get emotionally involved when you're reading. You know, I, I do, man. If it's, a, if it's a sad story or something like that, I'll wipe a tear and sniff a little bit. And, and you know, Jimmy, you crying? No, my nose just runs. You know, you know, that kind of thing. But when I read this, this fruits of the Spirit, it's like the light comes on. It's like everything changes in Paul's epistle here. Because he talks about all this evil stuff and he says, but. But the fruit of the Spirit, listen, let's, let's say, let's see if this applies to us. You can be the judge. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, and patience, kindness, and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control against such there is no law god says you know what i want you to love as much as you want 
I want you to have as much joy and peace and patience as you want because there's no law against it. He says, those who belong to Christ Jesus, and I would like to add, those who belong and have the Spirit dwelling in them have crucified the sinful nature with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. And let us not become conceited, provoking, and envying each other. Now, I'm not sitting here today and saying, we are perfect. We don't have any of those top things up there. Because we're humans, we're sinners. But what is ruling our lives? What is it that's guiding us, that's taking us? And I'm telling you, if you live by the Spirit, you're going to be attacked. Satan is going to attack you from the inside, and he's going to attack you from the outside. He's going to do whatever he can with your thoughts. He's going to do whatever he can with those who are around you. He will try to destroy you. Now, when we think of the Spirit, what do we think of? Yeah, we think about that crazy group down the street. You know, they're jumping up and down, screaming and speaking in tongues and dancing on the tables and doing all kinds of stuff like that. We may be thinking the healings and the speaking of tongues and the water and the wine kind of events and withering fig trees and miraculous catches of fish. But when we put all of that aside for just a moment and focus on something else, what if for just a moment, what if for just a moment we focused on God's presence? I want you to know I acted a whole lot different when my dad was around. Bet you did too. In fact, Alan's not here today. Alan Blackburn. I don't know if he even remembers this. You remember the guy that placed membership? <clears throat> One Sunday uh, after church, we'd gone, we went to East Hill Church there, and we lived right across the street from it. And uh, Alan, as I said, got into all kinds of trouble. And, and I, you know, he, he can verify it. But we came out, and I had gone ahead and ran up on the porch. And I was standing there watching. And Alan, we, it was a cold day. We were all dressed up in our coats. Had walked over, and we had some water uh, that had frozen, some puddles. It, it was cold. We lived in Nebraska, remember? York, Nebraska. And Alan had gone over and was sitting there breaking the ice. And my dad came over and just swatted him. Just, get out of that water. And I sat there and smiled, <laughs> thinking, better you than me, buddy. Because I knew better to do that. Not to do that, I guess I should say. Because I acted differently when Dad was around. When the Holy Spirit is in us and dwells in us, we act differently because His presence, God's presence is with us. A few years ago, uh, we went to, our family went to France. And... Um, we went to Paris first and then went to visit my brother. My brother had been a missionary. He's since moved back. But he was a missionary in Lyon, France. We went to Paris for a few days, went to Lyon for a few days, and back to Paris. And uh, I, you know, I, I was the guide. I could get us around Paris after all. Par le vous français. You know, I, I, knew, I knew French. I could get us around. I'd had some French in high school and college. And my kids, and I think of truth be told Martha too, we're a little anxious about me leading the way. And when we got on the bullet train and went down to Lyon, and Uncle Charles was there, who'd lived in France for 35 years, spoke the language fluently, knew the culture, knew everything, they just calmed down. It was amazing. Well, why did they do that? Because they were in the presence of one who had been there. When we are in the presence of God, when we allow him to dwell in us through the Holy Spirit, it calms everything down. Listen to this passage from 1 Corinthians 6. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? Let me read that again. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you? 
whom you have received from God, you're not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. A temple of the Holy Spirit. His everyday presence in our lives. One of the main works of the Spirit is to make us spiritual. And if you look at the Corinthian church, they spoke in tongues, they prophesied, they had all kinds of miraculous stuff. And what did Paul say about them? He said, you guys are infants. Tim Woodruff said, there is a greater work intended by the Spirit than the displays of miraculous power. Transformation, sanctification, killing the flesh, conferring the mind of Christ, unity, assurance, presence. It is this greater work that must be emphasized if we are to be, find an approach to the Spirit that is trustable. There's a whole lot more that the Spirit does beside miraculous things. There's an old hymn we used to sing, Break Thou the Bread of Life. And we'd get in the chorus and it would say, Beyond the sacred page all fetters fall. And someone concerned, uh-oh, we better change the words. And I've seen this changed. It says, within the sacred page all fetters fall. I think he had it right the first time. within the sacred page or beyond. Now, I know what people will say. Okay, Jim, beyond the sacred page, we've got everything we need in the Scripture. I'll tell you this. The Holy Spirit will not move us to do anything that contradicts what the Scripture says. Will not. But I think there are things that we need to allow Him to do in our lives that aren't specifically said in Scripture. Don't take my word for it. Throughout this whole study, don't take my word for it. I hope that you'll search the Scriptures. Don't have any preconceived ideas that keep you from seeing the truth. But I want you to enter with an open mind in all of this. And we need this. And I hope you enjoy these next sessions on the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Father, as we come before you today, we ask that your spirit dwell in us. To lead us and guide us and prompt us and direct us. Father, I pray that we feel your presence more than anything else. That we feel your presence. That we know that you're here with us, beside us, living right inside us. And I pray, Father, that we will always listen to the prompting and the call that you give us through your Spirit. That we will not be afraid to move. That we will be a church that's full of love and peace and patience. Help us to live by the fruits of the Spirit. Father, we pray uh, that we can do great things not because of who we are, but because of who you are through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.